by Henry Spicer, Esquire. The Witch Wife, A Tale of Malkin Tower. Act One, Scene One. Library in Pendle Manor. Sir Gerald Mole is at a table covered with books, etc. A large black board is suspended on the wall with geometrical figures, etc. A crowd of rustics at the lower end of the room, among whom is seen Alison Devise as a prisoner in charge of Stern and others. Sir Gerald appears absorbed in study. Constable, aside to Stern. Come, this won't do. Accost him, Master Stern. Assault him with your wonted eloquence. Make a speech, Master Stern. Stern, slowly and gravely. Ahem. Sir Gerald, abstracted. From A to B, C, D, draw three straight lines. Constable, aside. Oh, dunce. He still is his alphabet. To him again, loudly and scholarly. Stern, loudly. Ahem. Sir Gerald, starting. Who's there? Heaven give me patience. There's the thread of the work for the fifth time snapped short. Will nothing, sirs, deserve of ye some daily hours of peace? Go patch your quarrels in the buttery. I ne'er knew village feud that would not yield to the mild persuasion of a can of ale. If you feel drought, there's stuff to drown a county. If you want fuel, there's wood. For hunger, bread. In the orchard, boughs laden yet strong enough to help or hang ye all. Stop. Well, man, speak. Constable, bustling forward. And please, your worship, I will. Master Stern has been at school and learned the worth of words. He's like a ship provisioned with parched peas, doled singly by the nigger's steward. This old dame's charged on suspicion with bewitching Dame Pepper's old dun cow. Sir Gerald, studying. Which is absurd. But if, as was proposed, the angle be... Constable, hastily. Sir, if your worship... Oh, aye. Well, old woman, can you rebut this evidence? Go, sirrah. Call Master Marchmont Needham. He's a scholar, learned in the law. Aye, there's more sense, I tell you, under his curling love locks than resides in twenty ermine frizzlewigs. He's here. Enter Marchmont Needham. Marchmont, good day. Good morrow, my good friend. News reached me that our village courtiest had broached a theory of more painful proof than those which in this learned page you know so well to deal with, and I hastened on to offer aid. Thanks, thanks. Returns eagerly to study. The matter, friends. Constable, aside to Stern. Speak, speak, man. Witches. Needham, impatiently. Nonsense. Law. Needham sits. We'll hear the case, then. Who complains? Countryman steps forward. What, Master Finn? You don't seem pinched or withered in the flesh. What have you suffered? Countryman, scratching his head. Nothing. Needham, frowning. Fellow, here's no Christmas mumming. What do you allege against this poor woman? Out with it. Countryman, with much hesitation. Well, Master, she squints. God send us. Master Finn, amen. And put some brains in that disfurnished hut thy noddle. Get you gone. But in heaven's name, is not this monstrous? So one hath a sheep, sick of the kiddies, or a hog of the mumps, a girl of the sullens, or a boy of the school, and the poor thing's owl blasted, as ye say, bewitched, that is, while the first ancient dame that with a palsied eyelid hobbles by, hath don't of mischief. Of such sages I've known but five sorts and rate within these rules. Sick-witted, children, women, cowards, fools. Well, sir, and what can you suggest? What proof or witness? Ducking? Out, you ruffian! Sir Gerald, looking up. Stay, Marchmont. This must be looked to. Let's proceed with caution. I am a justice of the peace, and sworn to thwart the devil. Yea, give him bound up to the civil power. Come, Master Stern, your charge? Needham, to Stern. Well, sir, if she's a witch, you seem possessed by a dumb devil. Where's your tongue? Stern, producing a letter. There! Needham, examining it. Tis a scroll, Sir Gerald, to say truth. 
nor over clean nor clarky, but with all scratched in a bold, black, earnest hand enough, and superscribed to you. Ha! Huh. Read it, Marchmont. Needham reads. My service to your worship presented, I have this day received a letter to come to a place called Pendle Forest to search for evil-disposed persons called witches. I much marvel such evil members should have any to take their parts. Sir Gerald, uneasily. Who takes their part? <laughs> Not I. Shall I conclude? I intend to give your precinct a visit suddenly, for I would certainly know whether it affords many sticklers for such cattle, or willing to give us good welcome and entertainment, for so shall we work without control, and likewise with thanks for recompense. So I humbly take my leave, and rest your worship's servant to command. Matthew Hopkins. As he reads the name, a movement of terror among the country people. Is he coming? Then I warn ye all, burn every broomstick, say your prayers straightforward, and get to bed betimes. He'll find you out if there's a witch among ye. And if not, he'll make one. No man builds his giants better. Sir Gerald, doubtingly. I don't know, Marchmont. He's a gifted man. He comes not purposeless. I think I, uh, eh, we must commit this prisoner. You will hear the charge first. Aye, that's fair. Needham, aside to a villager. Hark, little Maggie, go seek out Mistress Cecile. Say she's needed to work a miracle. Exit Maggie. Teach a good, weak man the strength of reason, Master Stern. Your speech, condensed and pithy though it be, scarce guides judgment not pre-informed. A trifle more detail, sir. Stern points to a coffer held by constable. There! Enter Cecile, running. Oh, what a race! Dear uncle, lend me your watch. Quick! I gave Mistress Frill once round the pleasance where we walked to you and beat her by... A minute! Here she comes! Dear lady! Tired, ma'am? Offers chair to Mistress Frill, who enters panting and disordered. Ah, oh, oh, fie girl! Cecile! Don't knit your brows. You know I hate it. Come, I've told you that before. Mistress Frill, lifting her hands. Miss Cecile, child, you make my blood run cold. Cecile, aside. It never did aught else. Is this my teaching? Lack a day. Go stand in the corner till you've learned to give your elders reverence. Come, come, Mistress Frill. She's not a child, good lady. We old souls, evermore bragging of our own wise years, must let our juniors grow. Come on, wild thing, sit down by me. We'll make a pretty twain, justice and mercy. How shall we dispose these evildoers? Give them a crown apiece and send them home. Nay, but... Another word and mercy quits the bench. You'll be my clerk, good Master Needham. Do, Sir Gerald. You, sir, will be dumb, for justice acts, not chatters. Hold! Hey, Day, pray, who are you? Stern. You will find me sterner if you don't hold your tongue. What a black beard! <laughs> Look, Uncle! Sir, you couldn't sit to a painter for a cherub. Constable, sulkily. Madam, my lady, since tis his worship's pleasure you should hear, we've brought a witch for judgment. Witch? What? Where? I'd give the world to see one. Is it large, old, bearded, bent, with imp and broomstick, all complete? Constable to Allison. Stand forth there, prisoner. You, young lady, beware her evil eye. Cecile, starting up. I'll risk the... that. Why, that's my nurse, man, Allison Devise. Good, patient, loving, dear old Allison. Man, ere her years had half attained to thine, more deeds of love and Christian charity stood to her count then there are white hairs now on her poor forehead. She's the wayside flower, unseen, uncared for, loading the rich air with careless fragrance, one pure source through which the under, ever-flowing stream of good still rolls to bless the world. She, she, a witch! Dear uncle, do you hear them? Eh? Hey, why? Eh? Hey, tis she, that's certain, isn't it? For they say witches sometimes change feature to, uh, well, well, why didn't you speak, old woman? Allison, curtsying. There was naught to answer, please you. 
These good gentlemen were so resolved, I feared, sir, I might be a witch and didn't know it. That won't do. Produce the image, Master Stern. We kept one horrid witness back, hoping to spare your worship's tender heart, and this poor lady, whom, shame to yonder evil-hearted hag, it doth affect more nearly. Tis a form in wax, shaped like the Lady Cecile, doomed to devilish tortures, which, by wizard arts, reach to the living copy. First we lit, opens the coffer, on these, item one broom, one kitten, lame, sundry glass beads, six ringlets of fine air, and fifteen pins, some crooked. Next we came to this most terrible object. Produces an image. <laughs> Dear Master Constable, I thank your zeal that from this good old creature's drawer of treasures has rummaged my first doll. And tis like your little cherub face at three years old as Sister Peas. God bless ye both. That's why I kept it. Needham, rising. Master Stern and Constables, gets this poor soul, three things are proven. First, she squints. Second, loved babes. Third, half a kitten. Goes on for three legs. She is discharged. But stay. To make all sure, we will impound the doll and pop the cat in the cistern. So be off, and all whose conscience tingles mend your doings. For hither comes Matt Hopkins, Satan's foe, one who has brought more witches to the pyre than I have tongue to number. Some of ye see the poor woman to her home in safety, and... Uh, all shrink from her. How's this? All afraid? I'll guard her, uncle. Come, Alice, lean on me. Do as I bid you. Lean all your weight. I so. Edom, aside. Heaven bless thee, child. Lovely thou art, but glorious charity. The skill surpassing nature paints thee now with tints of heavenly origin. I'll not spoil thy good deed by sharing. Yet I may humbly proceed and smooth the hallowed way. Exeunt. Constable, as they go out. Well, what says Master Stern, the magpie? Wait! Exeunt. Scene 2. A Glade in Pendle Forest. Evening. Enter Anthony Gabb, Martin, and Vaughn. I tell you, we're too many. What the deuce brought you both poking hither? Martin, laughing. <laughs> this! Waving a paper. No pheasant was ever snared with verse. If you are in love, don't be ashamed on it. Uh, tell us like a man. Tis but a young disorder, like the chin cough. Best early caught and done with, but delayed. Ha, ah, as I live, here's another. Runs to a tree and snatches off a paper, which Gab tries in vain to obtain. And besides, some dogs hunt best in couples. <laughs> Here is Martin. Now were not I a sober gentleman of staid and shriveled reputation by to check his frolic passion? What you promise might have bought half a county. Hmm, let's see. Read. Glances that if they did not please would sure with terror fray us. Fair suns or blue cold spheres that freeze. Comets flashed fresh from chaos. Right, your stale comments not worth a bulrush. On Martin reads Lips like a rosebud newly cleft, ripe as an autumn plum, whereon some love sick bee has left its honey and its hum. Its hum? What does she buzz? No, to say truth, I lack the rhyme. But the hum? Critics might say she had a bee in her bonnet. <laughs> Sir, that hum's a humbug. Cut it out. Uh, so then. "'Tis here the spirit wanders?' "'Sometimes, too.' "'Eh, too? "'In ghosts and women all the interest ends with the individuality. "'I'm off.' "'I see shadow. Uh, still apart. Disperse! Disperse!' "'They retire aside as Marshmont Needham enters. "'All's clear enough, poor souls. 
The very name of Matthew Hopkins scares them like conies to their burrows. I'll watch here till she has passed, then follow. Retires. Gab advances, and stealing round, grasps him. Stalking, dear? What sport, sir? Master Gab, what do you hear alone? Indulgent in great thoughts, not doomed to find their issue in heroic deeds? Is robbery of the world, sir? You're a thief. I apprehend you. Come with me. First tell me, what is your object here? I, sir, attend sweet nature's vespers. Here's a scene to fix the soul. Aside. This ass will fright her. Blending shades clothe the sweet earth while one bright ray just threading yon stately vista to the grim old tower from out the very depth and womb of darkness conjures forth light. Like sparks on tinder. Yes. Mixed with the murmurs of the latticed leaves sounds steel like spirit voices. Dainty frogs, squabbling at supper. I could dream. No doubt. But I, most learned and poetic marchment, am very much awake. Never tell me. You care as much for vistas, towers and trees as donkeys do for diamonds. What's the matter? Who's that parting the bows? By heaven, tis he. Tis the witch-finder Hopkins, a bold knave, bankrupt in virtue as in wealth, and after any deed, as who can nothing lose in either. Savage brute! He treads as though he'd grind the very turf to powder. Ugh! Enter Matthew Hopkins and two followers. This path, they told us, led to the old squire's den, but I don't. Soft you, here are natives. Well, masters, what's stirring hereabouts? Gab, aside to Needham. That's cool. A squirrel on that bow, sir, cracked just now, a filbert that proved sour. By yonder style there lies a weasel simulating slumber, but he's a cheat, I take it. Sir, you are pleased to be facetious. I demand what's new in these woodways. Why, nothing, sir. That is, the devil writes farces, and mankind enact them. As for ourselves, we kneel, and in bright eyes see future fertile acres, buy and sell, pigs, oxen, and each other, backbite, chest, get drunk and sober. Tis in truth the world's accustomed chaos, needing one rogue more, with good bold vices to bind in the hole. Aside. And that's what's furnished. Will this present path lead us to Pendle Manor? Needham, aside. Not if I can help it. Aloud. No, sir. Know you an old hag, one Allison device? The honest soul dwells yonder. Pointing. Hopkins, grinning. Honest? Hey, Paul. Follower, gruffly. <laughs> Needham, aside. I'll lead these gentlemen to dance. Well, sirs, for love of such society, I'll be your guide, to hunt and manor both. Come, Master Gab, go with us. Gab, aside to him. Hang me if I do. Just leave your friends in some convenient ditch, and earn the county's thanks. Exit Needham, Hopkins, and followers. Now, Anthony Gab, sit down. Sit. And listen. Sir, should fortune yet untied of lavishing fair opportunities on such a recreant knave, Bring that sweet soul across your vision. Try, sir, to reflect. That legs were given for nobler ends than that of simply taking flight. That tongues should speak, and lips. Confound this fellow. Re-enter Martin. Still alone? Why, where's the nymph? Gab, sulkily. Not come. How's that? Uh, I saw her approach it through the trees. Gab starts up. The deuce you did? Ah, good night. It's getting late. What? Don't you want to meet her? Yes, I did. But now it's it's late. It's damp. I'm tired. I'll catch my death. I've got a hole in my stocking. Martin, laughing. Oh, <laughs> in your courage, man. Come, come, you don't escape. Stand up. She's here. Stand or she'll think you're drunk. I wish I were. No man's afraid. And his corpse. Then counterfeit. You'll do it to the life. Good thought. I will... But stand beside me. They retire. Enter Cecile, leading Alison Devise. Fie on this drear place, and on those aches that force me drag my weight of years so tardily. Now must thou return with those poor feet threading the long dank grass that teens with agues. Well, wit comes with age, and soon you'll hate me. They'll compel you. I'm an old witch, am I? Come, be calm, dear Alice. If I believed them, I must pity. 
Now you've love and pity both. What creature's this? Ah, tis my mute adorer, but bewitched and talking. Re-enter Gab, stumbling as if drunk. He reels against a tree. Sir, I really beg your pardon. Twas awkward. I never saw you. Did my nose struck yours? Why, what a labyrinth is here. Netters and bries. Where is my brother owl? Oh, here you come, you mouser. Re-enter Martin. Whither now? Madam, excuse him. A poor harmless soul when he's not drunk. Oh, come on, sir. Drunk, sir? Drunk? Have you ears to say so? This fair dame, this grand dame of the wood nymphs, shall be judge. Fair dryad, am I drunk? Falls on his knees before Allison. Hey, hey, he seems a merry gentleman. Stand up, poor thing. "'Tis very much a wittering. "'Away, nurse, come. "'I am ready, darling.' "'Darling, a sweet word.' "'Sit down.' "'A frank of all. "'All my spirit owns the sweet intoxication. "'I, I choose the sitting posture, "'having thus my legs, "'more as it were beneath me. "'Now would men dwell in revolving thickets, "'thus thatched roofs, would soon be deemed luxurious. Martin, aside to him. Courage. Speak to your goddess, man, or leave her. Gab, aside. Ah, faith, I dare not. Look at that eye. By heaven, its glances seem to thread one and pass on. Sharp vision, truly. Madam, tis late, and these are no safe paths for such fair pilgrims. Will you accept our escort? We'll leave you at your pleasure. Go then now, and for this gay, convivial gentleman, whose sin of drunkenness, I fain would hope, is no accustomed guise, so awkwardly it sits upon him, take him with you. Look, he's marvelously sobered. Gab, aside. Faith, she's right. We are both fools, and I the greater. Come, there's comfort for thee. Heaven be with you, madam. The field being lost, I yield it and retire, a wise commander sending, as you see, my heavier baggage forward. Exit, pushing off Gab. It has grown so dark. Lean harder, Alice. I can bear more than you think. How strange. If I were one to harbor gloomy prescience, I could deem some dark, unwanted, evil influence sat brooding o'er this wood. As they are going out, Re-enter Hopkins and followers, meeting them. A pretty guide. I never knew a fellow could discourse in words of twenty syllables like him worth a cock's feather. He deceived us. Ha! If I were sure of that. Hello, here is game, or two birds flushed together. Chick and hen. Hopkins, catching Allison as they try to pass. Stop, neighbor. Not so fast. A word with you. Cecile, agitated. What do you want? Why, firstly, child, to see from what red, pretty, rustic lip proceeds so musical a query. Cecile throws up her head with dignity. There, sir, back, and leave me room to pass. Hopkins admiringly. Hey, by these hilts, but you're a beauty. No clown architect built that brow's arch, I take it. You may go, young lady, I have no right to stay you. But this ancient fowl comes of another nest, and I must hear her singing. Sir. Hopkins, laughing. <laughs> Don't be so haughty, little madam. I am charged to hunt up certain witches hereabout, among them... Where's the paper? Here it is. <laughs> among them... Reads. One called Alison Devise, an ancient gentlewoman, rather lame, owning a slight obliquity of vision... Hmm. Causes of suspicion. Hmm. Ah. Uh, old. Dwells in the forest. Keeps a cat. Hates beer. Refused to kill a toad. Her imp, of course. Keeps a wax image. Vicious hag. Prescribes for cows in mortal sickness. Hmm. Which die. Here's proof on proof. 
Stand from before her, madam. Down hood, old girl. If you're not she, I'll eat you tough as you are unsalted. Tears off her hood. Seize the witch. I told you so. Let her alone. Stand back. Sir, with your sex a woman's weakness is her best assurance. You, it seems, would turn it against her as a weapon. Where's your warrant thus to molest us? None? That's soon repaired. We will but ask this lady's company to the next justice. Cecile, eagerly. That's Sir Gerald Mole, my uncle, who, on full investigation of the rank follies that disgrace us here, has set her free already. Humph. Are you niece to that old curmudgeon? I, I mean, that learned and wealthy squire. What's that to the purpose? Yet since you know me, sirs, in courtesy, let us be gone tonight, and take my pledge that this poor soul be at hall tomorrow, there to abide your question. No, fair lady, you little know the malice of this kind. We've stirred her venom now, and ere the morn, backed by the devil her lord, she'll scatter round a tenfold mischief. That is not my way of doing the work. Nor ever doth this hand lose its first grip till the foul prey be brought to that safe goal, the gallows. She is innocent. Heavens, can this be? It will not. You relent. You hesitate. Not I. Yet, stay. Come nearer. Don't be afraid. Is, is your heart much set on saving this old hag? Enough. I'll do it. On one condition. Well, sir? What? Don't frown, don't start from me, don't hold me drunk or mad, though I am both when urged to it, drunk with love as now. Cecile, shrinking back. Oh, heaven! Or mad with fury. Listen, you must be mine. Tush, I mean honestly. We are alone as t'were in the dark wood, and you shall hear me what I list to speak and answer to. I love you. You! Even I. No saucy glances, no curled lips, I warn you. I am not that I seem. I have a name for fearless courage, zeal, and sanctity, and truth. I feel within this ragged rind lies a concealed spirit, like a spell, awaiting but the charmer's voice to wake its fine and terrible action. Girl, that voice, that power are thine. I saw you and my soul, never yet moved, shrank helplessly, stricken, dumb. At once your slave and destiny. Cecile, faintly. I pray you. Hopkins, catching her. Stay. You must hear, must speak, too, for the game's begun and must be played out now. I love, I love you, maiden. I've no mincings drawled by feathered apes of the world, but by this sword. And that's a soldier's oath. I'll woo you like a soldier. Will you? Then be gone, and know when you would practice on a woman's fears, the true road to her heart, at least to mine, lies not through terror. Hopkins, eagerly. The true road? I'll not deceive you. This is idleness. To you, and such as you, there's none. Hopkins, furiously. Then. Checking himself. Stay. So young and fair and pitiless. I was not always the man you see me now. My youth stripped bare of all sweet subtleties that win mankind was wasted in vain search for bliss. At length I touch it, and tis ashes. Am I free to leave you now? You are, with this assurance, that as you scorn me and reject my love, so shall you find the hate you calmly dare as strong as love but deadlier. Our short strife passed in the dull depths of the silent wood. Revenge shall visit you within the gaze of gaping thousands. And before this sun... Goes. Ho! Oh, Michael, fools! Followers advance with Allison. Yeah, master. Let her go. I? Let her go, man. Did your grandam never teach you t'was wisdom to expend a sprat to catch a grampus? We have greater ends to compass than are gathered in the grilling of this piece of parchment skin. Heaven bless you, sir. You're very kind. Enough. A witch's benisons are doubtful gifts. Hesitatingly. Madam, 
If I might touch that hand, mistake me not, the pact is made. Are we not foes? On that condition. Gives her hand. Trust me, I will fulfill it to the death. Farewell. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 1. Apartment in a hunting lodge, opening in the forest. Enter Martin and Gab. I say again, I'm satisfied. I say I've every reason to be no less pleased and flattered by such notice. Why, you saw our meeting? Plain enough. If that meant love, heaven keep me from its tokens. I confess, my nymph is somewhat of the panther kind, as stern as beautiful. A pleasant beast for semblance that accepts her love with growls below all vocal divings, and soft pats but smash a human occiput. Come, come, you're disappointed. Own it. Not at all. Last night I added to my calendar a golden day. A what? A golden day. Those, sir, uh, are golden days on which I hold converse with Mistress Cecil. So, it seems the ice is broken. Uh, not precisely. She never fails to greet me, but, to say truth, my tongue has... Up to this time, steadfastly declined articulation. Then what passes? Oh, this. Ah, Master Gab. Or else, good morning, sir. Or, here's a fine day, Master Gab. For thus, as though to keep me long at her sight, she'll spin out commonplaces. Sometimes, tis most sweet and graceful and confining. As, should you meet goody plumstick gathering wood? Say that I have been at her cot, and left her what will cure her toothache. These are golden days, and so recorded. Silver ones are those on which we meet, but speak not. And all else are of that blank complexion, that no base dishonoured metals poor enough to note their sadness in. Why then, in point of fact, your suit stands still? Sir, uh, on the contrary, it flies, it rushes. <laughs> Drops a paper. Hello there. What? Snatches it up. Another poem? Ha. Well, read. I know we are in honorable hands. Martin reads. He whose time mellow judgment as it fit holds passion reference and silence wit. He that hath love hath courage, time and power should read the stars this night on Malkin Tower. And pray... Where found you this mysterious bidding? Pinned, like a sweet postscript, to a loving scroll, where on this teeming brain had lately spent some idleness in rhyme. You'll go? Gab, gravely. I will. Poor thing. One can't do less, you know. Perchance, two can do more. I'll go with you. Why, uh, you see, she doesn't propose that. As you will. Only take care. Care? Huh? You have no faith in such things. One in your lost state believes in nothing but his mistress. Such things? What things? Why, know you not that yonder Malkin Tower's a sort of witch cathedral? All the hags of the district gather there to consecrate unholy Sabbaths, raising, we may say, in truth, the devil's own row, since he himself presides there. How's the moon? Why, as I live, it is their very night, their storm, their revel, their St. Walpurga. Is it? Hang it now. That's most unlucky. Stay, I think I know a counter charm. There's Matthew Hopkins. I'll do him out once, and bid him lay his nets for a fine haul. A brilliant thought about it. Why, there he passes. After him at once. The time draws on. Tis noon already. No! Exeunt. Scene 2. Sir Gerald study. Sir Gerald studying Cecile. Quod erat demonstratum. Wondrous volume. Thou philosophical magic, mass of marvels. How through thy clear yet complex tracery of line and circle, mighty truths evolve and grow to life. Why pet? Cecile, starting. Drops her book. Dear uncle. Come, I've solved my problem. Let's have yours. It seems the harder, love. Why don't you talk? Cecile, smiling. And spoil some great discovery. Sir Gerald, 
gravely. You would not, Cecile. Talk when you will, my child. I can resign with ease the filmiest and most subtle thread of argument. And when your voice has hushed its music, turn, old spider as I am, to my unbroken meshes. But tis because that happy spirit, like a hidden sun, is ever beaming on me. So our blood runs its articulate course, dispensing life, vigor, and health through this wrought frame, the while the functions of the busy brain proceed, and feeling heed it not. Come, let us hear your voice. Speak. Ask. Sometimes I cannot hold pace with your questions. So I will. Now listen. Dear uncle, you are very learned. Sir Gerald, smiling. Indeed. Who told you so? But are you not? Well, well, a, a thing or so, perhaps. Learned and kind and just? I hope so, chick. Cecile starts up and throws herself on his neck. You don't believe Nurse Allison's a witch? You don't believe there's one in the wood, in the country, in the land, in earth or heaven? You, uncle, grave and wise, cannot yield up your great prerogative of reason, judgment, truth, to that wild dream, born of an idiot's fancy, nursed by knaves, insult to nature and to nature's God, that hideous, writhing mockery of nothing that men call witchcraft. Soft, nay, soft, my child. There, be composed. I never saw you thus before. These matters are too deep and strange for your young judgment yet. Some ten years hence we'll argue them. Some ten years hence? And what till then? Go, darling, run to Mistress Frill. Tis school time, eh? First promise. What? To give no heed to any that shall seek to use your warrant and the name of English law against poor souls like Allison. Come, come, what know you of these matters? Till tomorrow. That's but a day. I cannot promise, child. I'm but a servant of the Commonweal. I trust to hear no more on it. Wait, at least till you've consulted Master Needham. I consult? Come to your lessons. Stay, how dare you go without kissing me? Cecile runs back and kisses him. There, there, remember. Exit. Sir Gerald, looking after. It's odd enough. I always thought till now Dame Nature, through her fair gradations, glides with steps so slow and noiseless that no eye detects the stealthy movement. Hitherto the babe we nurse on Monday is not much too big on Tuesday. Nay, a fortnight thence may still be danced and fondled. Now it seems the world's received an impetus, a spur. The toy we dote on goes to rest a child, and rises woman. Enter Hopkins hastily. Stern follows. A fine dance indeed. High time I came among ye. Here we've plumped into the heart of witchdom. What do you say to that, Sir Gerald? Sir Gerald, abstracted. That, sir, if the bases and altitudes of solid parallelograms be but reciprocally proportional, the parallelopipeds are equal too. Tis most unanswerable. Aside. The old fool, as well accost a milestone. Sir, I need your warrant to take certain rogues suspect of devilish arts. A warrant and, perchance, more power to... Power, sir? Where's your lever? Lever? Sir, the immortal genius Archimedes wrote, uh, tis in science annals, Give, wrote he, give me a lever only big enough, and a mere place to fix it, and therewith I'll move the world. Great man. A wizard, sir. And that perforce recalls me from your wise, instructive converse to the work in hand. That warrant? Haste! Sir Gerald, aside. Now could I but divert their thoughts till Marchmont Needham comes. Let's see, some lively problem. Master Hopkins, one of your grave aspect, cannot but have drunk at geometric fountains, reveled in the luxury of angles. Hopkins, aside. We must try another system with him. Sir, I've given my brightest years to mathematical lore and found all's nothing. Algebra's a hoax, Euclid a humbug, a pedantic ass. I saw it and exposed him. Did you so? Oblige me with a trifling illustration of his absurdities. Just cause to meet two parallel lines, or will you square the circle? Square what? The circle. Hopkins, boldly. Yes. The deuce you will. Science has offered some ten thousand crowns to him shall do it. She has. The liberal soul, I'm half ashamed to take it. Nevertheless, just 
to oblige. Now, sir, attend to me. Takes the chalk and approaches board. A is a country justice, kind but weak. B is a zealous witch destroyer, thwarted and crossed by A. C is the public, looking to both for comfort and protection. Well, Sir Gerald, reluctantly, the point is clear. Most lucid. Or again, let A, B, C be certain witches. D, the, the devil, and E, a ducking pond. Now then, tis plain that lines from A, B, C produced to E, and there united passing downward to D, get their desert, and there we'll, with permission, leave them, and proceed to business. Now, sir. Offers pen and paper. Sir Gerald writes reluctantly. You will need some aid to back the warrant, eh? Let's see, let's see. Old Simon Mopchase, bedrid to be sure, but then his name as constable. No fear, I've three stout villains, pious knaves enough, who put their trust in God and carry cudgels. And Richard Stern, the eloquent. Ere you sleep, look for some news, Sir Gerald. Plenty. Exigent Hopkins and Stern. Sir Gerald, alone. There, tis done. And now, as eager to reproach my too precipitate yielding, here comes Needham. Enter Marchmont Needham. Why, you seem breathless. What's the matter, boy? Does yonder ruffian lie? These walls contain no ruffians, Master Needham. True, Sir Gerald, they have attained their object. They have wrung from your unthinking judgment what the law wisely withheld, and have set forth to grasp their helpless prey at will. This little pen has pricked a vein of innocent blood, will drain the life from bosoms that ne'er beat with aught but love to you, goodwill and charity to all mankind. Shame, shame, sir. Master Needham, I would forgive this speech. You're hot and young. Age, sir, that dims our eyes, destroys at least that fine false medium which in early years clothes guilt in rosy attributes. Enough. Sit down, and I'll reward you with a problem unmatched in simple grandeur. Let— Excuse me, this nonsense. Sir Gerald, starting up. Nonsense? Look, sir, here's a problem. Asks no great wit to solve. See, from this point, this center, A, my manor house, I draw a circle, B, C, D, within the which I do not ask your entrance. Exit. I was wrong to cross his humor, yet so far it spares expenditure of thanks and compliment, for here's a more implacable summoner, chiding me hence. Takes out a letter. What madness chains you, man? What spell beguiles you from the noble strife your soul was pledged to? Wherefore cast your staff aside and like a tiny pilgrim sit, dreaming beside the waters? Up! Awake! Come to life's battle and earn rest. The worn and wayward sleep thou art neither. Good blood, friend, I love thee. Have thy will, and yet methinks e'en their stoic nature might discern discretion in my madness. Am I asked what spell? Ah, Cecile, it replies. Enter Cecile and Maggie. Do that, and then return. I'll keep your skipping rope. T'will bring you back the sooner. Exit Maggie. Master Needham, with that grave aspect, what's the matter, sir? I cannot laugh. Cecile, skipping. Nor skip? There, mind your eye. I saw you wink. Keep off, then. Cecile, Cecile. Well, what's the matter? Oh, I did not tell you our frolic for tonight. Tis all arranged. Masks, dresses, broomsticks. Needham, amazed. What do you mean? A feast of little witches, sir, is held tonight in the dells of Pendle Forest. There's a moon brightening expressly. Dews will keep their distance. And there's a band of merry forest minstrels led by one Signor Chicala engaged to dance. You'll be there? Alas, I must to horse within this hour. To horse at once, and make haste back, sir. I shall be... Too happy. Of course you will. Be back by half-past nine, for at that wizard hour, Sir Gerald Mole will be in the moon with Euclid. Mistress Frill in a laced nightcap, safe in bed. And I, with twenty other madcap damsels, called out of my village pets, O oh, the vicinage, holding a banquet in the Malkin Tower, shall craze the owls that mope there. Are you mad or jesting? Neither, sir. 
Ere now you've told me, more truly than politely, I was strange in fancy as in deed, defying rule, marching to strange, not all unworthy ends. By quick cross paths, while others will jog round, pay toll and pass more safely. And in truth, you're right enough, I fear, for when at chess I beat my uncle, dear old dreamer, planning some wondrous game, with a quick thought at once conceived and execute, he cries, Ah, pia, absurd, unscientific. So it was, but then it won the game. And may I know the secret of your present plan that seems to my plain heavy judgment dark enough and, and perilous withal? Assuredly. The plot, sir, has two branches. Mr. Gab loves me and needs discouragement. He, therefore, has been beguiled to meet, you'll not guess whom, and here I'll not say what. A graver end is this, to prove to such as, on pretext of witchcraft, dog the steps and hunt the life of every lame and ancient gentlewoman, that they are fools and might as well harm me. For May Day masking and fantastic sports as those for sorcery. Ridicules the cure for these witch seekers. Never trust my word. If I don't make them dance tonight to a tune, shall hiss them from the country. Would to heaven I might have stayed tonight, word but to mix with this unmellowed plot a drop or two of plain discretion. But I must be gone, must bid farewell. Sweet Cecile, will you hold your poor friend in remembrance? Will you, Cecile? says seal faintly you are saying this to vex me tis too true i go to-night why then you're very cruel i thought you loved us all that's why i've teased you you might have studied euclid all day long in peace and comfort else and now you leave the hawk the spaniels mistress frill and me and more than these, than all, the kind old man that loves and leans on you. But he himself desires it, and, were that not so, a voice as potent calls me. Cecile. Cecile, passionately. Go then, go. Why do you wait? What care for here? O oh, heaven, to dwell six happy months, accepting love, respect, and hospitality. And when you've stolen our fancies, just turn on your heel and part. Tis cruel, cruel. We're well rid of such a guest. I'm very glad to lose you. Only it breaks my heart. Bursts into tears. What do I hear? Away suspense. Throws himself at her feet. Oh, Cecile, oh, sweet bird, start not to hear this strange and sudden tongue. I love you, Cecile. Common love needs time and grace to perfect it, but mine was born gigantic, sprang to manhood at a leap, and stretches to you its true honest arms, offering a refuge where your love shall, in its own good season, flourish too. You blush, you tremble. Cecile, do you love me? I, perhaps I, I'm not sure. You needn't ask such downright questions. Cecile, I must take my fortune with me. Sweet one, can you guess what love is? Yes, amour, of course. It was my first French noun. I asked dear Mistress Frill the meaning. And she? Hemmed and hawed and frowned, first simpered, then looked stern, and said at last, a longing for sour fruit. Good Madam Nature interprets far more sweetly. Cecile, speak, I love you. Will you be my wife? You love, and you'll be gone tonight. It is love's self that spurs me. Sweet, you shall know all. Meanwhile, this scholar's gown grows threadbare. I must woo Dame Fortune for a fitter. No, in that, and that alone, approach me. There's my hand. Kiss gentler. Why, the eloquence that scorch on the dumb lip can find no better vent than burning kisses. Oh, be faithful to me. Be kind, be loving. But in a few short weeks, then, reunited, passing hand in hand into the sunny vista, Love's bright world will make its paths eternal. Now, farewell, farewell, one kiss, my Cecile. Oh, the music of those sweet wedded words, and you'll give up for my sake, will you not, this wizard scheme tonight? Cecile, smiling. I've little heart for it now, believe me, but it's too late. Indeed? Well, dearest, may the kind intent hallow the mystic means you work with. One word and I go. Sweet Cecile. There are some points in every life wherein all wandering rays of happiness converge. 
Even in such a haven, such sweet sheltering bay, we anchor now. Then, loveliest, once more search thy heart. If change were at first prompting here, here in this quiet wilderness my fate interpret to me. So content I am, to know the world no nearer here I'd pause. Here at thy feet, lie down, here rest, here die. Cecile, smiling. The search were fruitless, sir. I never loved until you taught me. If the lesson's good, lies in the proof, I doubt. Oh, Marchmount, Marchmount, may heaven forgive you. Sweet for what? You've spoiled the calmest, sunniest, and most innocent dream. I thought I was a child. Oh, love, 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 if you enrich us, tis but a debt repaid. You robbed us first, therefore we owe you nothing. I am a slave now, must be docile, grave. Never climb trees again, nor care for skipping. Oh, if you knew how I have nursed this dream, this happy, careless, thoughtless, tearless dream, you would have spared it for a while, not plucked this young old age upon me. Heaven forgive you, I won't, till you return. Aside. Who knows? Perhaps you'll come the sooner for it. Needham, eagerly. Cecile. Cecile motions him away. There. Leave me. Don't speak. Away, I say. Exit Needham. Gone. Gone. Bursts into tears. Act 3, Scene 1. In the wood, near evening. Enter Gab and Hopkins. In point of fact, then, do I take you right? If not, correct me. Which, oh no which, tis my duty to mount guard and Malkin Tower, and take what follows? Every principle of love demands it, sir. A man is bound, says Euclid, to keep love tryst, though he stump bleeding and footless thither. Hang it, man. Can't you use milder illustrations? Euclid, those ancient poets were such budges. Nothing would serve but blood. Our wiser times content with guileless milk and water. Never mind. I must not quarrel with my monitor. The confident is, to a man in love, essential as a mistress. Hopkins, aside. So it would seem. I'll wager not a soul in twenty miles but has been yours. Tis almost time. You'll walk some little distance, eh? I'll keep aloof. My hounds are out. If there's a witch in the wood, she'll grunt her vespers to the devil her lord twixt four stone walls tonight. Come, sir, away. I'm rather nervous. Have no fear. You go on a high mission, man. The world's large heart expands with sim- The world's large countenance expands with mirth. When any great mess hap befalls one. So be near me, as you promised, and if you hear me whistle, so- Or scream, that's better. We'll be with you. All success. How now? Why, what's the matter? Hold up, man. Is it a witch? E yes. Or, or a woman. Now, should it be her? Enter Stern and two others, disguised as old woman peasants. Well done, my rustic beauties. Here's masking faith. Pray know this gentleman, Sir Mistress Richard Stern, Miss Sampson Vools, the Lady Peter Bullman. Covert, boys. Stay, though, I'll post you. Master Gab, you stare. You'll see more wonders yet, sir. Come along. Excellent. Scene 2. A Glade in Pendle Forest. Exterior of the ruin called Malkin Tower. Moonlight. A village girl enters, disguised as an old ugly woman with broom, her dress torn and disordered. Girl, crying. <laughs> Fierce brute! <laughs> Yet he's a civil dog enough by daylight. <laughs> Another enters suddenly. Judy! First girl, starting. Who, who's that? Dear, dear, I thought it was a wolf. It's Katie Hewitt. How pale you look, child. What's the matter? Matter? If you'd been half devoured by Burroughs' Mastiff, you might look pale. Kate, I do think it's wrong. 
a flying, you may say, in the parson's face, pretending to be witches. Nothing's wrong, Miss Cecile says. I'd play the very... First girl, stopping her mouth. Hush! You wouldn't. Here's some more, thank goodness. Enter Maggie and several others, similarly disguised. Maggie, here's a repentant witch. Let's send her home or she'll infect the party. Little coward. Don't mind. I'll give her heart. Take courage, Judy. Aside. You know the white thorn on the low moor, child? Just think you're there and young Will Peters. Stuff! He didn't. What? Why, kiss me. Well, and pray, who said he had? You did, or, uh, perhaps you might if I hadn't stopped you. Enter Cecile, disguised. Scolding children, do you forget you're not mere flesh and blood, but witches, things that own no foe but truth, reason, and sense? Ahem. Aside. The last, I fear, is scarce upon our side. It's past time. I stopped to listen to a nightingale. He had a deal to say, and to my ear, never sang so sweetly. Well, he's flown. Let's see, are we all here? What? Only ten in all? Where's my pet Rhonda? Frightened and gone home. And Polly Freer, in squeezing through the lattice, was caught by her mother, whipped and put to bed. Two witches less. And Dorcas Ames? She's got the whooping cough, my lady. Little imp, give me a kiss. Come then, let's make the best of our scant fellowship. Witches, I hope you met some honest people by the way and let yourselves be seen. I've other ends than a mere moonlight skipping, clothed in rags, I promise ye. Have courage and observe all that I said this morn. Maggie, the paper I bade you hang on the oak, did Master Gab detect it? Yes, I watched him from the tower. He spelled it twice, then tossed his hat in the air so gaily that it caught upon the tree and he had to climb. Cecile, hastily. Hush! Skip! They retire to the tower and other spots as Gab enters. Uh, the wood's asleep. I wish I could say snoring. Any sounds, how rude, so a, a melody. I'd sing. But that the echoes in this cursed dell give one's own voice a witchy twang. I'll try. Hello! Girls within. Hello! Hello. Gab, starting. Ugh. I thought so. Hang it, now. That echoes in the daytime's a mere grunt. The north wind with a quin a whole sup. Calls. Don't be a fool! Girls, within from different parts. Fool. 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 Maggie, from the tower. You fool. It is herself. She knows me. There's no echo. Saving this bosom. Help me, love. The path up to thy bower is dark, and might I judge by certain irritations, slightly fringed with... Stinging nettles. Ah! A bluish light seen within. Oh, thanks, sweetest hero. Leander comes. Ah! My, my ankle! Ah! ah a toad! So, one more scramble, and all safe. I'm... Mm. The interior of the tower becomes suddenly illuminated. Gab starts and falls back to the ground. Help! Song within. If I wish to the mountain gate, and all strange shapes, shapes assemble, assemble, gather till with fiendish weight, weight, the old walls shrink and tremble. And tremble. Snake from the pit, pit toad from, from the tomb, tomb, cat from, from the cottage ember, hurrah for the hell broth, bay with broom, broom, blue, blue fog and black November. Mercy! Uh, I'm in the witch trap! Caught! Betrayed! Poof! Tries to whistle. <laughs> Poof! My lips are parched. I'll creep away and give them notice. Cecile, within. Folly in man's form approaches. 
Rudder skin out, out, good fiend, and make it prisoner. One of the girls, dressed as a huge rough dog, runs down and seizes Gab. Cecile and the rest following enter on all sides. Gently, gently, fiend. Seize, but do not mangle him at first. The wretch must have witch baptism. See, that's all prepared. Then to your knightly pleasures. Tatuba, your butt a baby imp. Stay with your mistress. Cloisa, hunt the yellow raven. Hawthorne, ball, burn Goody Joyce's haggard. Fancy, fancy, bite the brown cow. Gab, aside. Amiable pleasantries. What mischief next, I wonder? They surround me. Now for an incantation. Join your hands. In a low, chanting voice. All ye that have stolen the miller's eels, laudate dominum de coelis, all ye that have given consent thereto, benedicamus domino. Aside. Dear Marchmount, who taught me that rude rhyme? Now heaven be praised, you cannot see this folly. Worthy souls. He calls us worthy. Tie a knot in his tongue for lying. Mercy, I retract. Vile hags. Vile? I, I beg pardon. Mild, or mischievous, or lovely, or loathsome, faulted, or fragrant, bells, or bell dames. Only let me escape you now, and never shall this Christian hoof again impress your cursed precincts. No, you've seen too much of our dark doings. We must take judgment and memory from you. Ho, oh, there, bring the goblet filled with a nightmare's blood and spiced with acorns. Cup brought. Drink or die. Gab, aside. And die? You mean, I am forbid fermented liquors? Pray, excuse me, I have a bilious habit. Come, to supper then. We only stayed for you. You're very kind. Aside. I wonder what foul dish they browse on. Wretch, I read thy thought. Tonight we've got a sodden fool. Gab uneasily. Uh, uh, what? You'll know in time, poor creature. Does the cauldron boil? Dread mistress, no. Drop in the woolly knot plucked from a bat's left ear. Now for a dance, to give us an appetite, and then... A grotesque dance, during which several figures enter and mingle with them. Cecile, pausing suddenly... Dark comers, what air you are, disclose yourselves. Hopkins and the rest throw off their disguises. That will we. All fly, but Cecile. Cecile hurriedly... Stay, children, stay. Flight ruins all. Remain, and you are safe. Hopkins, aside to the rest. Disperse, don't hold them. Aloud. Fools, you can't bestride the moonbeams. Let them go, we've got the queen witch safe. Cecile eagerly. Back, little fools, show what you are. Why, so they do. All vanished, fiend, imp, and sucking witch. Ho, oh, Master Gab, stand up, man. Gab, bewildered. Nightmare's blood. A donkey's tail. What witchcraft out on theft has bagged the wits of this poor gentleman? What error it was, the venture was a bold one. Master Gab, if I and those poor frightened maids have used some merry freedoms with you, pardon them, and see us safely hence. I, I, uh, uh, I... Look how he shrinks and trembles. When she speaks, strange thrills come over me. Yes, that's her spell. Come, bring the witch along. The witch? Keep off! I know you're ruffian leader, but for you, beware, sirs, how you use me. I am a lady, niece of Sir Gerald Mole. Indeed. Then, lady, niece of old Mole, but nevertheless a witch. Will you be pleased to walk, or shall we make a litter for your dainty ladyship to visit the town jail? You dare not use this vile indignity. Nor for the sport we follow. Pretty sport. Who was that bade fire Goody Joyce's haggard? See? A conflagration is seen rising. Cecile, aghast. Great heaven! What have I done? You hear? She owns it. 
Come, Cecile, faintly, to the manor. What's the use? Your worthy uncle's in his first sleep, but if it's any comfort, here's his own warrant. Aside. Struggle as you will, you're in the net. Cecile, aside. Oh, Marchmount, had I taken thy counsel. Come. Aside to them. Who fired the haggard? I. Excellent. Act Four, Scene One, Hall in the Manor. Sir Gerald, much altered, sits at the table, regarding his books, etc., with a vacant and bewildered manner. Gab and Mistress Frill, seated apart, watching him. Mistress Frill, sighing. Ah, I fear you're wrong. Excuse me, I am clear he did. He spoke distinctly. Master Gub, sit down, sir. You're a fool. Mistress Frill, eagerly. Did he say that? Gracious be thanked. I thought his wits were gone. At least, perhaps, they're awakening. And of course, at first, see, Mr. Lee, fool is a word that means so little. I knew a merry squire would pinch his wife by the ear and call her fool. He's a pretty jealous fool. Well, I must take my leave. I fear I tire you. But, in truth, since that accursed eve in the Malkin Tower, I have no comfort, object, act, or thought out of your presence. Dearest Mistress Frill, I love... Sir! Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, of course, to talk with you, of Mistress Cecil. Idiot that I was, not to perceive it was jesting. I to bear witness against her. May my tongue be served first. Oh, Cecil, Cecil, oh, my goodness. Walks about, much agitated. Sir Gerald, looking up. Cecile, she's to be tried today. Mistress Frill, aside. Who told him that? Nonsense, my dear Sir Gerald. Turn your thoughts to wreck a natural pipe it's. Sir Gerald, sternly. Wreck the what? You don't know what you talk of. Never think to play on me. Alack, I know there's something gone from my brain. I can't define a rhombus. They'd whip a schoolboy for the faults I make in multilateral polygons. But one thought is nailed and rooted here. I moan it, or nightly before I sleep. My darlings tried today for witchcraft. Heaven protect its own. We are powerless. Are we? Where's my mantle? Come, let's go. But... Dear sir, whither? To the court. I have a word to speak if my heart hold, but time grows brief. Good Master Gab, you loved my poor child, did you not? Be welcome, sir. Exit, leaning on Mistress Frill. I love this child, and welcome. Does that mean welcome to love her? Huh. I only wish she'd found that out before. It's like a man bidding good morning as one goes to bed. More courtesy than significance. Ah, oh, brain. For once be active for some good. Devise some means to save this angel. Would to heaven Needham was still among us. To my mind there is about him a plain simple wisdom that in his presence really makes one feel almost an ass. If he should... Starts back from the window. Heaven forfend! This should be witchcraft. Yes, one can't mistake. He's eager step. Tis knit him as I live. But spurred and cloaked. Leans out at the window. Hist! Hello! Marchment! Stop! Don't you know Anthony Gubb? I'm coming! Wait! Runs out. Scene 2. In the grounds. Enter Marchmont Needham. When flight's impossible, tis wise to show a fair front to the enemy. Master Gab. Enter Gab. Welcome. How thrives the muse? The muse be hanged. So, so. A lover's quarrel? Uh, I shall change your tone, or I'm mistaken. Pardon me. I can be grave and ought for to say truth. Some strange misgiving has enticed me back, long ere I purposed. Prithee, what's the matter? This Hopkins is not... Gab, eagerly. Yes, 
He has. Found out some grand dame flirting with the devil and clapped her steeple hat upon them. Worse. Sir Gerald's. Mad. And no wonder. Needham, impatiently. Out with your tail. If it is of the wounding nature, use it like a sword, not like a gimlet. Mistress Cecile? No. They dare not do it. Mistress Cecile chose to play the witch in the wood. Upon the sport came Hopkins and his ruffians. All were scared and fled, save that sweet angel whom they seized and bore to prison, and with some few more, by whose condemning they may collar hers, shall be tried to-day. Do you hear? This day, Monday, the last of beautiful May, henceforth accursed in nature's calendar. To-day? To-day? That's fatal. You, oh, you will drive me mad. Think of some remedy. Let her die, then see what all your learning's worth. She wrote, the clown shewed me the letter. I spelt it. Marchmont Needham. Needham, starting. Now, heaven forgive me, a more thoughtless fool never wore bells. I but assumed that name worn by a scapegrace cousin. Then you're more villain than fool. You indeed were art so honest as a sword. You are mad. Gab, passionately. I am. I love her, sir. Whatever you say, I'll care not. Who knows it now? I'd give my life to save her, and with my last gasp, place her in your arms. For that's the home she looks for. Needham, pausing. You have learned love's lesson nobly. Offers to take his hand. Gab, refusing. I believe you wise and honorable. Now, sir, I would rather cross swords than hands with you. No, no, good friend. For so you must be, be it mine to dictate a nobler contest, for a richer prize. Advocate as I am, I cannot use my calling now, nor with a bold truth scatter this foul charge to the winds. Yet there's one hope and time wanes fast indeed. We will divide the work between us. Hie you to the dolphin. Tis there the judges, Gyre and Howlett, lay last night. Then summon patience and await a mounted rudder, bearing a sealed scroll, which, while in London, should have reached my hand, but that my haste forbade. Stay for no words, but force your way into the very court, and place that scroll beside me. Is that all? Well, but the rest is easy. We shall see. I dare not promise. At worst, "'Tis something to know the worst. Heaven prosper all. Away!" Scene 3. Room in a Prison Cecile, alone. Twelve days alone. No knowledge of what's done or what's to be. No sign of sister life but the dumb wretch that doles me needful food and spreads the couch that brings not rest but tears. Where is my old kind uncle? Alice, Maggie, and Marchmount, what of thee? Hast thou received my earnest mission? Was the bearer true? Then why no answer? Why? So ever ends my mournful questioning. The twelfth eve, and lo, there passes from the earth the golden smile that kept my heart warm. Linger in the skies, there's a sad sweetness in the sun's farewell. Tis a tried friend that leaves us, passing slow and often gazing backward. So he goes, slowly, how slowly, scattering crimson light on tree and tower, then hilltop and then cloud, as one in dying, turns on loftiest things his latest aspirations. Ah, farewell. Enter Alison Devise. Cecile flies to embrace her. Ah, a dear face! Nurse Allison, thank heaven that gives us comfort. Comfort? Fool! Cecile, starting back. Why, nurse! Would I had nursed a snake ere cherish thee. I'm an old branch, sapless and winter-worn, fit for the burning, but to slaughter these is more than murder. Heaven assoil their souls, the young unready things. Cecile, aghast. What mean you? Alison, fiercely. Mean? That you had better died in innocent sleep than let your baby fancies loose to ape witch feast in Morgan Tower? Nurse, Alison, why don't they come to take me home? They'll come to... Pshaw! It chokes me. Why, poor silly lamb, 
You're pinned for slaughter. All right, thank you for my death in other guise. Cecile, shrieking. Death? Clasps her eyes. Twas fine sport to frighten young silly gentlemen, but stake and chain are ugly toys. Cecile, still clasping her eyes. Death! Several women and children brought in by jailers. Prisoners. Come, no bawling. Get to your cells and bellow till the devil your master comes to your succor. Hang ye all. Allison to Cecile. More of your victims, madam. Cecile, wildly. What are these? What brings old age and childish innocence to this dark house of grief? Yourself. Woman, exultingly. Tis she. Gossips, tis she. Her frolics there in the wood brought Hopkins hellhounds on us. To her, all. Give her a parting token. They surround Cecile. Jailer, driving them back. Off ye eggs. Well, we can curse at a distance. Pretty devil. T'will be like water on the flames to know your delicate limbs must feel them. Are ye mad, or is this all a hateful, hideous dream? If so, here's one bright spot. Why, favorite, my Lillian, little darling. Sweet, come hither. Come, come, in with you. Woman, fiercely to Cecile. Let my child alone. Spit at her, Lillian. She's a witch and murderess. The child repulses her. Exeunt to inner cell. Nurse, nurse, my heart is broken. Falls on the ground before Allison. Pshaw! Your tears won't melt stone walls. There's your poor uncle blind with weeping for you. All his learning drowned in helpless dotage. Master Hopkins rules. Fine sport, child, is it not? Torture me no more. Oh, Alice, Alice, this from you. Can fear turn your old love to gall when mine defied malice and vile report and left me your sole friend? Allison moved. Why, Mistress Cecile? Now be mine. This is the earliest home my memory claims. There... Put my head upon your kind old breast. My night shuts early in. Allison, passionately embracing her. Why, they shall rend me, fibre and vein. This worn and worthless frame shall yield and crackle in the rustling flame, ere my vile, graceless tongue shall breathe again one word of anger toward thee. O oh, my child, my darling. Monsters, men of bloody minds, if in the din of your steeled bosom dwells no touch of pity, then look up and fear. You dare not cut this blossom from the earth, lest all else wither. Hopkins enters rudely. Jailer follows. Turn the old witch in, I'll have some chat with the other. Exit Jailer with Allison. Now then, girl... Time's precious with us both. No whimpering, come. Is your mind changed towards me? Yes, from scorn to loathing. Why do you haunt me? Tis a folly. Yet I would save you from a rougher grasp than that of Matthew Hopkins. Can you... Come, I'll not say love, but bear with me. Who knows what may ensue? That's a fair offer. Come. Age brooks no coynesses, those womanish toys, the spurs to younger fancy. Rude as I am, I've some good points, and at the worst if Matthew be a grim bridegroom, death's a grimmer. Psha, marry me and had done with it. I will first dig with these hands my grave. Unhappy girl, I am thy fate, trust not my pity. Man, I trust my innocence. What's that? A child of heaven, no kin to thee. Poor witness. Here you're innocent enough, child, if that's all. And therefore you denounced me. Well, you deemed a name disgraced, fenced out like some rude field that no man owns, a haunt for thieves and beggars. Was fittest for your wear, a truth-turned coward worth that alone. 
Report hath painted you daring in purpose, resolute in deed. Yet in the spirit of my soldier sires, which I think prompts me now, girl as I am, I give you fair defiance. What do you see to gaze at thus? As fair a fleshly work as ever nature fashioned. Silly one, hadst thou ambition mated with thy courage, we too might rule the world. Wit, courage, beauty. Faith, here are costly elements to cook a bit for the devil's supper. Must a child instruct you that ambition, ill-directed, first made, then peopled hell? Here's change, of faith. A week ago you were a simple thing trundling a hoop or trembling at the frown of that sweet composite of starch and snow, your governess, Mother Frill. Of late, I think, you have found other teachers. Oh, I have. I have. Hopkins, furiously. I knew that scholar's frock concealed some crafty purpose. Hang me, but I ever mistrust a man in petticoats. You love this Marchmont Needham? No more trifling, come confess it, or... Grasps her arm. How dare you touch me, fellow! Then for reward of your vile insolence, no, I love and am beloved. I, more, I have sent to warn him of his Cecile's danger here, and he will fly to rescue, or there's little of love or truth in the world. The devil you have. Psha, pedant coxcomb. Jailer, entering. He is a stuttering clown, charged with some message for the prisoner. Should he have entrance, Master Hopkins? Hmm. Is it her familiar, think you? Hath his eye an impish cast? It hath, sir, as it were, a smack of gooseberry. Nothing more. Admit him. Exit jailer. Cecile, aside. And sunshine with him. Marchmount. Re-enter jailer with countrymen. Give it me quick. There, take the chantment. I'd have burned it, only I feared twould do me mischief. Sorrow on me. They tell me you're a witch. If you're a man, you served me, notwithstanding. Yes, they did. They sent me to a place where Master Needham, with other gallants, all silk and lace, was playing bowls. I poked a scroll in his face. He frowned and laughed, and tossed it to his friends, and bade me say, for answer he was then within five points of the game and twenty crowns, depending, so he caught the letter up and left. A witch, then, beast? Eyeing her curiously. Ha! <laughs> ha! Discreet, courteous, and loving. Well. Cecile, faintly. I am to be tried today. Hopkins, aside. She's mine, within this hour. The haste is mercy. Now you'll leave me. Though six words from yon poor clown have, in this heart of mine, stifled a lustrous world, there yet remain some earthly scintillations which my soul needs peace to wrestle down. Grant me so much, and go. I have chosen. Hopkins, in a rage. Obstinate fool, thou hast. Rushes out. Act Five, Scene One. The Justice Room. Representing the Trials of the Supposed Witches, A.D. 1634. Before the Judges, Geyer and Howlett, Hopkins, Stern, Clerks, Officers, etc. Allison Devise and others at the bar. The room lined with spectators of all ranks, among whom Needham is seated. Set them all forward. Allison Devise, Rachel and Margaret Pinder. Lillian Gray, tried and convict of witchcraft. Tried, my lord? Most tenderly, for tis a Christian land, and you inhuman, hellish, murderous. Sentence. Nay, I must speak. Oh, ye ungrateful crew, sit here ten hours. Your fate, ten mortal hours, hang in the balance. And after that, not tried, not tried. Proceed to sentence. So I will. 
but such ingratitude you of all persons within this land have the least cause to murmur seeing what time and labour have been spent in taking your lives why look around ye what persons of your nature and condition have with so gentle soft solemnity been graciously convicted no 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 all your lives long be ahem <clears throat> howl it quickly and that is to say till you are hanged to-morrow for the blood of many victims cows and horses and other his majesty's subjects cries aloud give heaven due thanks first that your horrible sins have been so soon cut short then that your end hath not been swift or sudden as a blow but with the grave and gradual course of law and lastly tis your sweetest consolation that the full record of your devilish deeds is left behind as warning you'll be hanged to-morrow and tis time farewell wise world where every wrinkle on an old wise face is brand of felony hen keep your souls from taint of richer blood my lords remove them prisoners withdraw set cecile howard to the bar needham aside hold patience death of my life tis she Starts up. Cecile is brought in, guarded, and placed before the bar. Officer, to Needham, who presses forward. Stand further back. Cork up your pity, friend, and hold your tongue. This trial is for life or death. Good fellow, are all this crowd or I grown lunatic? Your luck was something wild. Come, set you down. At least be mad like a gentleman. Hush, hush. Silence behind there. Ladies, I can't stop your padding, but by cracking the man's head that's nearest to you. Come, proceed. Hopkins, coming forward. My lords. A moment, sir. Why stand she thus alone? Have you no counsel, prisoner? Three, sir, but they're of strange speech, and in this court will scarcely stead me, I fear. How do you call them? Truth, reason, and innocence. Add another, justice, for you shall have it to the full. It seems you don't mean to keep faith, sir. Or what doth this ruffian here? Turning on Hopkins, Hopkins aside to her. That shall you know anon. Your wisdom, grave and learned justices, lopping the infected branches, hath left bare this trunk and root of the mischief. Even to a source so bright we track the thick envenomed flood that taints our neighboring world. I see you gaze as doubting even the devil's power to gain mastery of such fair province whose good hap angels might sentinel. But I, my lords, alas, see deeper. All the garden wearing the stamp of Satan's hoof, her spirit's soil arid and cursed, her holy leaves stripped off, all glory gone. There stands before you here a lightning-withered Eden. Turn this way. Leave shuffling with your feet, and do your best to fix that wandering, guilty gaze on her of all this court that knows you, to revenge a just repulse. Hopkins, hurriedly. My lords, she'd speak before my charge be made. Lest that, the motive known, no man accord an ear to it, in the dells of Pendle Forest. Listen, only listen. She'll have you think I hid myself in a wood to court her, whisper love. Cecile, quickly. No, heaven forbid, love's empty name is yet too sacred for such foul association. Look how close sin lies to the door. I charged him not, yet something beyond his nature's impulse or control from his own lips forestalls me. Yes, my lords, in the twilight forest, this grave gentleman came on me unaware. It seems my face had the mishap to please him, for he paused, and, as a schoolboy skips aside to pluck some red-lipped daisy, would have gathered me. 
That honor I declined, and therewithal his lover's vows to more congenial oaths of vengeance changed, find promised action here. I pray your pardon, I have done. Henceforth void my name what poisoned drops they will. I have deserved no worse report than one who, in the motley tumult of this world, is jostled by a knave. Sit down. Poor soul, poor soul, what virulence. Tis just their way. Dick Stern, how strongly she's possessed. Ah! Gentlemen, by what strange license does this grey buffoon, this solemn ape, chatter and grin unchecked before our faces? Fie! Hopkins, furiously. A chit, a child. Not so young neither, but she might have learned the world's ways better. That she eyes me thus askance, I can forgive. No culprit thinks the hangman in Apollo. What's the matter? Officer, de Geyer. Sir Gerald Mole, sir, claims admission. Cecile, starting up. Uncle, then all is well. Hopkins, aside. The devil. I thought I had that old bird safe at least. Enter Sir Gerald, supported by attendants. No matter. All the wit he owned lies dead in that dull eye. He'll do our cause good. Dear Sir Gerald. Sir Gerald, not heeding. Cecile, where are you, darling? Why don't you come home? You are the center whence my circling life is drawn, and lost all's crooked. There's no circle without a center, love. Oh, gracious heaven. I'm very old these three days, and I sit alone with dry eyes moping. It is hard that old age cannot weep, but must cage up its burning woes within the heart's dry veins, till time quench life and all. Sir Gerald. All so dismal yonder. Mistress Frill's heartbroken, and wears her rough awry. What's this they tell me of people to be hanged? Well, have you more to say, Sir Gerald? Oh, sir, this. I've learned mankind as well as Euclid, and I know that the worst angle science ever drew is made by the dangling criminal. Poor soul, he wanders. If you listen, sirs, he'll prose till midnight thus. The fault is mine, tis mine. I cursed her. When they said she was a witch and swore, I know not what. I, I, alack, who deals in curses surely doth invade the armory of God. I'll make it clear. With a short, I forget. A sane man, sirs, but with a wit grown wildered, and a heart too heavy for its fleshy home. Oh, Cecile, my child, my flower, fair, gentle, graceful, mild, full of sweet charities. I should know, I think, for she was seldom from me. Mistress Frill, where's Mistress Frill? Turning, sees Hopkins. Oh, treacherous, smiling villain. Had you no means to work what you call justice, but you must use the old man's trusting hand to slay his darling? Cecile, eagerly. Uncle, Dear, kind uncle. Sir Gerald, struggling. Let me go to her. Back, I say. What, fellow? I'll bring you with my crutch. I'll... Oh, I am weak. I want you, Cecile. Falls back into the attendant's arms. Hopkins, eagerly. Sirs, my lords. Aside. Pale fools, they sit aghast. In the king's name, my lords. The king's belied. What rascal's that? Look to it. Who spoke? My lords. I did not notice. Sirs, let's come to business. Yield not your grave ears captive to dotish wailings, nor regard this fair illusion. Crush the devil, even in his gorgeous palace. Let the golden walls crumble in fires of earth that the poor soul once to a holier kingdom consecrate, be purified and saved. Think where tis writ, no witch shall live. Howlet, nervously. Yes, as you say, let us to it. There's no defence, I think. So, Master Hopkins, you must recount once more this dismal tale, and twill suffice. I cannot hold. Starts up. My lords. Cecile, shrieking. Oh, heaven! Hopkins, angrily. What nonsense next? Oh, sir, tis you. Here is a second gentleman to be soothed, dare the king's work proceed. Sits down sulkily, Geyer to Needham. Be silent, Usher. 
Look to that person. But the prisoner needs counsel, my lords. Have you a right to plead, sir? I cannot claim it. Still... Geyer, loudly. Out of the court! Be gone, sir! Noise at the door. Gab enters, forcing his way through all, and places a packet in Needham's hand. Needham, aside to him. You have saved her. At the least I pray your merciful and learned lordships read my petition. Geyer, rejecting it. Fellow! Hangman, down! Geyer starts up in a fury. You insolent clown! Here, Marshal! Beadles! Whip this rascal forth! Needham, pushing them back. Not yet, sirs. Stand aside. I'll take that seat a moment. Walks up to the bench and places himself in the center. It would seem there's room for justice. Sirs, I am Richard Bromley, new Lord Chief Justice of the Common Pleas. Here's the King's signet. Here's the warrant from his gracious hand that trembled as he wrote, with kingly passion for his subjects slain by blind and brutish ignorance. Or what worse, witness suborned. My lords, although my power extends not to unravel this foul web of sophistry and slander, miscalled trial, I'll cut the sting out. Bring all those condemned back to the court. Sits. Allison and prisoners brought in. Poor creatures, you are free. Pity and gifts for all, and chiefly those by your vile means convict. To Hopkins. Hopkins, aside to Stern. A change of wind. That always brings a gale. Just wait the lull I've not done yet with her. This court dissolved. Never again to test on ground so frail issues of life and death. Mark, gentlemen, already in these fair and tranquil scenes where, if at all, mercy and truth should reign, there is a more enlightened spirit born. Foster it, and farewell. All rise. He descends. Enter a marshal hastily. Alarm. May it please your lordships to pause some space, until your javelin guard have well dispersed a somewhat angry crowd now thronging the court precincts. What's their object? Revenge, my lord, upon the witnesses. They say the poor man's blood hath swelled the purse of Hopkins and his band, that these are true, and he's himself the wizard. So doth crime fashion its proper scourge. To Hopkins. Get you within till night, then rid us of your presence. Psha! Open the doors. Come, Richard. Stern, drawing. Ready. Cecile, eagerly. Stay, stay, Master Hopkins. Let your last act be a gloss to its base precedent. Some rude minds may yet retain the poison your bold lie, and my own folly placed there. Take away this hideous stigma, and all wrong beside I'll freely pardon you. Hopkins turns at the door. Good. That's my duty. Advancing. I'm glad you stopped me, madam. I had gone else, leaving the fancies of yon fickle crowd to goddess you. If ever, as is writ in terms that none dare question, our fallen nature took service with the fiend. Behold, for here stands one who for three years hath practiced charms, filters, and all the deadly art of hell. Yea, how much longer she and the devil know best with whom she made her covenant. Record this in your souls, and wait heaven's vengeance. Stay. Who's for a merry wager? Come, I'll bet that ere three months, Sir Richard Bromley, Lord Chief Justice, weds a witch. A legion imps dance at the nuptials, and the fiend himself be bridesman. There's my blessing. Striding towards the door, need him to constables. Go with him. See him beyond their fury. Alarm. Hopkins, furiously. To the devil. Show me the man dare lay his finger on me. Come, Richard. Back, thou witch. He rushes out, stern following. Loud alarm as the doors open. Let him be gone. To the rest. Withdraw a little, but don't quit us. Something whispers a sequel here. Life of my heart, but for that impulse unmistakable... Wherewith thy presence thrills me, this might pass the pageant of a dream. Speak to me, Cecile. You love me still. From the heart center to the utmost born of sense. Cecile, glancing at the spectators. They look on me with doubt, and yet you love. What's that to me? I'd clasp this lily hand where it's stained with gore. Slack not the grip for any frowns of earth. And if I have no power to clear thy name... I'll even love thee more. I thank you, Marchmount. 
Now hear my answer. For your sake, this hand shall wear its maiden honors to the grave, knowing no other lord, but I'll not link with thine my soul, curse-laden. Little know you how deep and clinging are the stains imparted even by a villain's hand. Needham, eagerly. You will not? Cecile, pointing to Sir Gerald. Look at that old man. He loves me as his being, yet he's bewildered with an aching sense of wrong. And if there be a leaning, tis to think me guilty. Tis impossible. Be that the test? It shall. They approach him. Dear uncle, here's an old friend come to greet us. Sir Gerald bewilderedly. She of Endor drew spirits earthward, and among them one more than she dreamed of. Who shall trifle with the powers of darkness? Let's to thought and prayer, for Master Hopkins is a pious man, and he has sworn to it. Cecile, calmly. Are you satisfied? Needham, forgive me, for the thing you loved is no more, Cecile. Since we parted, Ages have swept above me with their wintry wings and blighted all my youth. The dream has closed, as such dreams will, in darkness, and tis time you left me. Go, there lies your world, and here, my sorrow's grave. Turns away. Alarm within. Voice within. Open the doors, quick, quick! The doors are thrown open, and Hopkins, disordered and bloody, is borne in. Many follow, kept back by guards. What wretched thing is that? My witness! Hopkins, hoarsely. Water! You've had enough, I think. Gives water. My lords. Stand by, good fellow. Let me tell it. You shall sit and drone and mope by many a Christmas fire when my pipe stopped. Raising himself. You told me true, Sir Richard. I found the county up and bellowing. Death to the witch informer. What the deuce? We could not fight the parish. Awkward clowns, they don't know how to duck a man, and yet the pains I took to teach. I think I broke one fellow's head. You did. I'm sorry now, but never mind him. Now what's more to the purpose? Take all your eyes from me and nail them there. There on that peerless piece of maidenhood. Praise, pity, love her. She's no more a witch than I'm an angel. She falls in Edom's arms. Era demonstratum. In God's good time, tis done. Hopkins, lifting himself with difficulty. Don't blind me. Ah, tis the world that loses light. Help me, I reel and stagger through the gloom. But there's a speck cresting the darkening waves. Young lovely one, give the old sinner pardon, and dismiss his gray hairs peacefully. Cecile, eagerly. Think not on me, nor man's forgiveness, but that yours. To the attendants. Good friends, look to his hurts, I pray you. The more guilt, the longer respite's needed. Tis too late, he's gone. Remove the couch. One friend, sweet Cecile, awaits your kind remembrance, and full well. Indeed, he merits it. Going Gab, Cecile, giving her hand. Dear Master Gab, take all that's left me to bestow. Warm thanks and earnest friendship. Are you happy? Hush, don't speak. I'm answered. All is well. It is. And thanks to heaven it shall be. For as now these curtains close upon each varied show of mimic mirth or anguish, even so hath growing reason spread her vial between knowledge that is and weakness that has been. From heart to heart, on wings of mercy, flies a free and brother spirit, and supplies, for sorcery, sense, malice, the will to please. For filters, wit, spells, smiles, and witches, these. Curtain Falls End of The Witch Wife by Henry Spicer To Anna Cora Moat A name familiar to the English public as that of an accomplished authoress and actress, but to which a more select circle annex the better title of Dear and Honored Friend, this piece is dedicated, with the, the kindest, kindest wishes of the writer. This 
is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.